Welcome to the second See Me podcast, looking at the economy and Christian views on the economy. My name is Graham Leach, and this morning I'm interviewing Peter Warburton, Director of Economic Perspectives, one of the city's most respected economists, and somebody who really has a strong Christian view as to how we should run things on that front. And so we're going to be interviewing Peter today, and we're going to be looking at the issue of freedom and fruitfulness. Um, I can remember when I first asked Peter a while back now, how would you describe God's economic model? And the, he said one word, freedom. Well, I'm going to give Peter the chance now to talk about freedom and fruitfulness. Graham, thank, thank you very much for your kind introduction. Um, it's a great pleasure to um, contribute to this series of interviews. And um, yeah, for me, the, the starting point for uh, thinking about uh, a biblical view of the economy for me is, is about freedom and, and this it, Bible talks about this, this glorious liberty of the children of God and I think the story ob obviously is a complicated story because it's a story that we were uh, we were created for freedom that, that we were called as it were to to be free um, but um, because of um, the Garden of Eden and the fall then we needed to be rescued. So in other words, that, that liberty was then won for us by Jesus Christ through his life and death and resurrection. And so, if you like, the story we encounter in the Bible is one where God always intended us to, 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 be, to be free and, and he then provided the means for us to, to be free. And so the issue for, uh, for, for everyone is um, how free are we, how much have we embraced this wonderful gift, this wonderful calling in, into freedom? Um, and then perhaps a little bit later, we'll talk about how I think that, that freedom really is the foundation for fruitfulness and that God expects us to be fruitful. But just to start really a bit more talking about freedom. So um, obviously when, when we talk about economic freedom, we're thinking, thinking things like freedom of movement, freedom of expression, freedom of conscience, freedom of assembly, association, freedom of thought. And, and all those, these things are, are, are important. But I think the, the biblical sense is one that we are, first of all, we are free from something to be free for something. Mm. And so I think a, a, a lot of, of how we think about um, biblical freedom is is what we need to do to be free from the things that would hold us back. Uh, and obviously that's free from our own personal failings and, and, and mistakes uh, and the consequences of those and all the guilt and the shame and condemnation that comes with them. And I think as the gospel of Christ has, has kind of got shut down in lots of forums and places, then if you like access to that uh, liberty, access to that, that, that sort of freedom, um, has also diminished. And I sometimes think of the age that we live in as, as one of, of endarkenment rather than mm. enlightenment, because I think there, 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 are, there are many people who want to close down um, uh, the message of the gospel of Christ. Uh, and indeed, when I listen to even something uh, as venerable as Radio 4, mm. um, and, and Radio 4 has, has a thought for the day, and, and you know, most of the people still who share on that platform are Christians, but actually, the name of Jesus Christ is very seldom spoken. It's mm -hmm. almost as though um, it, it's, it's become um, a sort of a dirty word, um, that um, you know, a disrespectful word to, to use. Um, Peter, so, could I just jump in there? Because yeah. freedom is so important. It's so important from a, 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 a religious perspective, from mm -hmm. a Christian perspective. Um, but also it has much wider economic ramifications as well. Mm -hmm. And that's part of the issue today, surely, is that people are focusing there. They are begin trying to curtail the freedom to talk in, a, in an open Christian sense. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, that erosion of freedom will have economic consequences as well, ultimately, not necessarily immediately. Mm -hmm. But if we erode freedom of religion, um, freedom to espouse the gospel, mm -hmm. we, people don't realise, but that, has economic consequences? I, absolutely. I, you know, I, th I think the the wonderful um, release that we have um, really is. I mean, I mean, there's two aspects, but I mean, we, we, we're released to take risks. 
okay so so that we we're free to fail so if like that's one of one of the fundamental freedoms that god, god yeah. gives us is, is that we're free to fail that that, that failure is not fatal um and and and, and it, it doesn't we're not under condemnation for failing um and i mean the the other aspect i think is is partnership with god in the sense that that, that he he is uh, creative and productive and fruitful and he invites us into partnership um, to, to be similarly so. Yeah. Um, so, so now I, I, I think the danger of um, uh, of shutting down this you know the, the sort of the, the Christian conversation um, is that so many people don't just don't understand what they were made for and, mm. and they, they don't understand what they could become and so I, I, I think this foundation that freedom gives for fruitfulness uh, is absolutely fundamental to a healthy and growing economy and and yes obviously the, there are other systems that have not lent upon it um, you know the, the, I'm not I'm not saying that the Christian model is 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 the only model but I think it's God's design and, in, and intention for us when we are ignorant about God and his purposes for us um, then there is, there is a sense in which, because we're not giving him the respect and the worship um, that he deserves, uh, there's a sense in which we are actually stealing from him. Mm. And, and, and there's, a, there's a verse which has always intrigued me um, uh, about not stealing, um, but actually working with our hands and having something to share. Uh, and I don't think there's an economic term for for what uh, God <laughs> uh, 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 describes, or I, I, I maybe put me right on that, but um, it isn't consumer surplus or producer surplus, but it's actually this the sense of being blessed so abundantly that we have more than enough for our own needs, that we have something to give away, something to share. I think John Wesley um, has this wonderful quote and, and expression um, that we should earn all we can give all we can and save all we can and that has, has kind of been my my approach my motto is is that um you know that, that god intends and indeed in my own testimony it has he's been true to his word he's been true to his promise that, that that he does bless abundantly and that abundance is not for us to squirrel away um, and uh, you know, it's, and not to bury in the ground, you know, as mm. per the parable, yeah. um, but actually that the five talents should make five more talents, and the ten talents should make ten more talents, and, and so on. So, I think what's being expressed here is, is a natural state of affairs, um, which, which is of, of, of multiplication. Now, it's, it's not to say that there aren't um, winters of of economic life, even even in a a biblical frame of reference um, there, there, there's obviously there's, there's talk of, of pruning and the, there's yeah. you know there's the, there's talk of, of striking down which, you know which that which is diseased and uh, you know and is, and is going wrong so, so that um, it, it's not a, a perpetual um, multiplication uh, it, it but it's it, it, you know it's subject to to the seasons and the disciplines of, of life as well but I, I think that a lot of um, economic thought is now directed to a, a sort of static model that, that somehow um, we're embarrassed um, we're embarrassed by our achievement and we've committed some dreadful crime you know by by growing the economy and lifting all these people out of poverty we should sort of shrink back and no longer regard growth as um, as a desirable objective but, but you know, there are still so many, you know, hundreds of millions of people Absolutely. who have yet to experience, that they've yet to step into liberty, they've, they've, they've yet uh, to own anything, um, they've, they've yet to see the, the, the wonderful dynamic of bringing some capital to bear upon their human activity. It could be a spade, it could be seeds, it, it could be a bicycle, um, but there, there are people in Africa still with no capital, with nothing with which to apply their labor. Yeah. And, and, and just, um, you know, just the very smallest amount of capital put into their life 
um, is transformative. I think it's a I think this is fascinating because if we think about the industrial revolution and economic takeoff mm. 200, 250 years ago, then part of it, I mean, Deirdre McCloskey in her kind of bourgeois virtues uh, trilogy uh, argues that it was the changing values, it was the changing attitudes. And to a great extent, post-Reformation, mm. the church lost, not immediately, Luther and Calvin actually were quite traditional, mm. but um, there was an asceticism which was lost and it suddenly became good to, to, to actually be productive and to create wealth. Yeah. Merchants were seen as the alien in the mist. Yeah. Um, and it's almost like we're going back to the future again now, that we're, go we're suddenly feeling guilty again and yeah. thinking there's something wrong and materialist yeah. about the creation of, of wealth, where yeah. uh, then God clearly warns about materialism, there's no doubt about that. Yeah. But he also blesses and encourages the creation of wealth in the Bible. And um, yeah. that's now just you, you've talked about freedom and forgetfulness, um, but maybe in the, kind of the second half, we can talk about something which is very close to your heart. I know um, that ages me a little bit now because mm -hmm. I can remember 20 odd years ago buying your book, Debt and Delusion. Mm -hmm. um, but you've got some very strong thoughts there, Peter. And mm -hmm. do you want to share those with viewers? Yes, thank you. Yes. So. I suppose we're, you know, we're all influenced um, by our upbringing. So I had uh, an older father. I, I think I, he was about 44 when I, when I was born. And so he was old enough to have had the, the formative experience of starting work in 1926, the year of the general strike. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, the, the early years of his um, working life were really quite difficult. And obviously after 1926 came the Great Depression, which wasn't as severe in the UK as it was in, in America, but, but nevertheless was, was a, a, a very thin time and, and a very difficult time. But really out of that, he had a very strong uh, life view um, of not taking on debt. And in fact, he waited until he'd saved enough money to buy his first house. So he bought, he bought his first house for cash and never, he never took mm -hmm. a mortgage. Now, you know, I'm not saying that, that, that um, I, I was so strongly influenced that, that I didn't have a mortgage. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> that, that's not true. But when I had the opportunity, um, when I was still in my 30s, to become debt free, um, I felt God, God was really calling me to do that uh, as, as an act of obedience to do that. And that was really sort of uh, around the time that I was thinking about this book. Um, debt and delusion. Now, I, I mean, I, I don't want to give an impression that uh, debt is is all bad. Now, clearly, there's there's debt that can be a means to productivity and wealth creation. So, why should a community, you know, have to wait 20 years for clean water? You know, no, you know, let's borrow the money yeah. and let's give them clean water because that will be a blessing and it and it will enable so many other things to happen. But in Western society, um, increasingly. Uh, debt has become, um, unfortunately, uh, a means of, of delusion, um, of sort of uh, false prosperity, um, and ultimately enslavement and sometimes ruin. And so it's, it's understanding really that, that debt has a spiritual power mm -hmm. and, and that um, you know, there's this wonderful charity called Christians Against Poverty that we've supported for some, for some years that actually does this nitty gritty um, detailed job of helping somebody and many people on the brink of ending their lives be because of, of the pain of the debts and, and the endless letters and threats and, and so on. But it, and it helps them to give them protection from their creditors, puts them in, in partnership with, with a church and other Christians and um, you know helps them to rebuild their life and, and, and rediscover their, their their purpose and, and their value. Um, so I, I, and I think we, you know, we, that we, we shouldn't be ignorant about the extent to which unrepayable and, and expensive debt is, is enslaving people in our, in our countries today. And, and, and obviously that the, as we head into a probable recession um, and, and much incre increased interest rates, uh, for those on, on uh, variable and unsecured loans. Sadly, we, we're very much in that territory mm. again. 
So, you know, I think, yes, there are many good things that can, the deck can be used to bring, but I think uh, sometimes it can be a pathway to a better future, but it can also, in other circumstances, steal from um, a future that, was, that wasn't particularly bright in the first place. And I think there's this illusion that, that many uh, people have that if a lender is willing to lend them money, it's because they must be a good credit. Uh, and and what, <laughs> what they don't realize you know, is, is that actually it's not really an expression uh, of that at all, but rather um, that they believe that this person uh, will, do, will make whatever sacrifice is necessary, or, or maybe will be able to, to get uh, money from other members of the family in order to, to make this debt, this debt good. After all these years, um, you know, we, we, we still don't really have effective caps on, on the, the, the rate of interest that can be charged. So, you know, so, so that there, there are many people who start with the smallest of debts um, that then spiral in, into, into huge burdens. And so I think this is a significant area still where people need to be set free. It's almost a modern form of usury. <laughs> it's, it's, yeah, it's, yeah. Um, you know that, I, and, and yes. So, so obviously, you know, after all the work of uh, Wilberforce and, and, and um, all the uh, those who, who, who sought to abolish slavery, but it's as though somehow we managed to reinvent, um, you know, the, the evil of slavery. We find a new way to to ensnare people with obligations that that will weigh them down, and and so I think a, you know a significant part really of. Of, of what the, the church should be about is helping people in the most practical ways to get to get free of, of burdens which, which are preventing them um, from living in in the liberty that, that that was intended for them. Thank you Peter that's a really thought-provoking point on which to finish. Thank you for your time. Thank you.